The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. All right, good morning. I'm Beverly Bond. I'm from University of Memphis. I'm also on the Board of Trustees at the Pink Palace, so I kind of know the routine that that's going to come on every time. Uh, the one thing I wish I had was a nice podium because I'm a little nearsighted, but that's all right. If it seems like I'm reading this and it's moving closer, uh, that's simply because I'm trying to see. Okay, um, I'm going to talk this morning about basically African American women and the women's suffrage movement. Um, I don't have handouts or anything, but um, I will just kind of direct you to some sources that might help you to figure out what was the role or what were the expectations and the involvement of African American women in the suffrage movement. Now I have to give you a little background on how I got involved in this um, or interested in this. And there are a couple of th different things that I could use. One is that there have been a series of articles in the New York Times and in other newspapers that really talk about how are people commemorating the women's suffrage movement. And the fact that in these commemorations, in the creation of statues for commemorations and all of this, many times they tend to leave out the role of African American women, um, which kind of played into the second reason or um, kind of motivation for my interest in this topic. And that was when my daughter, who lives in Massachusetts, and who went to a very elite school in Massachusetts, a women's school in Massachusetts, um, called me up one evening. She is not a little girl, not a child. Uh, she's probably about uh, the age of many people in this room. Um, so she called me up and she said, I'm working with a group and we're doing such and such a thing. And we're going to create some activities on the suffrage movement. And she said, and you know, I was just interested in picking your brain. She usually doesn't do that unless it's a topic related to history. Um, you know, old brains are not worth picking or whatever, but something like that. But anyway, I knew something was coming. The last time she started this conversation, it had to do with um, slavery and abolition, because she knows, you know, I do a lot of research on that. Uh, women's suffrage, I didn't really think she knew that I'd had any involvement or interest in or had done anything with women's suffrage. So um, I said, okay. And she said, we were talking, this group of friends, and one person who was also a graduate of an elite women's school um, pointed out, she said, this woman said that they didn't have to do any research on African American women because there were no African American women suffragists. And I was like, you've got to be kidding. I said, this is what we paid all that money for you to go to school for? <laughs> I said, first of all, would you just kind of mention the name Ida B. Wells to her? Um, and then back it up and maybe mention the name, who is this first of all? Frederick Douglass. Oh yeah, he's up there. Uh, mention the, the name Frederick Douglass and um, see if they understand the role that, first of all, Douglas and then Wells and many other African-American women, Mary Church Terrell, played in the suffrage movement. Um, and do they fully understand the nature of the suffrage movement, which can be a little complicated as you go through different time periods. Um, we like to think of the activists in the suffrage movement, and I heard you mention several of them, a few minutes ago. We like to think of them as these wonderful little ladies, most with gray hair, who were committed to getting women's rights for all women. 
and who were committed to um, expanding the electorate. And that, of course, this happens in the early 1900s. But we really don't fully understand the women's suffrage movement unless we put it in the context of what is happening in American history. And we back it up to, first of all, its connections to Frederick Douglass and the abolition movement or the anti-slavery movement. And we look at what was happening and we understand that some of the early women's rights activists were also activists in things like abolition, um, in the whole reform movement of that period, the reform tradition of that period. And then I'll come back and talk about Douglas and his involvement. And then just talk, and then if we think about this in terms of what happens in the rest of the 19th century, um, civil war, um, emancipation, reconstruction, all right, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, and then finally get to this 19th Amendment. But we have to think about those other amendments first. And if we think about in the late 19th century, to kind of carry this all the way through, and then I'll come back and talk about um, as much of this as I can, I'd like to give you some time to ask questions so I may skip through my slides. Um, if we then think about the late 19th century, the disfranchisement of African American men, the, de the sorry, the segregation movement, um, the ideas of suffrages on who should get to the, the vote and how should this be done, and really consider is this a universal effort? Is this a desire to get the, the right to vote for all American citizens? and put it in the context, again, of the fact that if you've already disfranchised a huge segment of the population, are you going to push an amendment to enfranchise the women in the segment of the population you have disfranchised? So you have to sit and think about these in terms of the suffrage movement, but also think about the fact that despite this situation, that African American women were active in the suffrage movement for their own reasons, that they were involved, that Ida B. Wells created the first suffrage club in Chicago, the Alpha Suffrage Club, that when she was told in the early 1900s that she was, it was, not, she was not welcome to participate she and Mary Church Terrell in a suffrage parade with the suffrage organizations from their cities or their states that Ida B. Wells said, okay, and she stood on the sidelines until her club came forward. And then she rushed around to jump into the line so that she would be with them. All right. um, Mary Church Terrell did something a little bit different, but she had a reason for doing something that was different and for going along with what people said that she should do. Um, but again, there were all these different reasons and ways in which black women participated. But we have to think about the fact that they had their own reasons for participating in a movement that they knew had as part of its objective to eliminate them from voting almost as soon as they were enfranchised. So we have to be very, very thoughtful in the way that we think about suffrage so that we don't create a narrative of the suffrage movement that does not really go along with what we know to be the narrative of American history. Um, many times when I get high school students, former high school students who are coming to college and you know, I'm in my African American history class and I'm talking about all these different things, and they say, well, why didn't we learn this in high school? I'm saying because, you know, I say, and I taught high school American history. That's why they always ask me to do things like this. I taught high school American history for 25 years. Um, I started when I was a baby. <laughs> and that was my first career. And then when I became an adult, I moved over and started teaching college. So, you know, it's been a long career, but starting in, 
in the crib. Well, when they get to my classroom, I often tell them it's because learning history has to come in stages. You have to kind of learn the basics. You have to think about this basic, what we call master narrative. Learn that. Learn the people. And then we'll complicate it for you when you get to, con to college. And it's the fact that we are complicating the narrative that keeps our students coming to class, which we'd like for them to do. Um, just as the fact that you taught the narrative, the master narrative, the kind of general framework and the people, when you teach that in high school, you often don't have time to go back and complicate it because once you complicate it, kids ask a lot of questions. So it's kind of good to kind of get all the way through it. And it's okay because we'll complicate it for them when they get to college. We'll make them think again. Okay, so let's start with Frederick Douglass. And as I said before, or if you think about it, the 1800s, the mid-1800s, was a period of reform. But the reform of the mid-1800s was not something that involved all Americans. Reform never does. Right. Uh, the reformers of this period were involved in a lot of different kinds of challenges. Um, Anti-slavery abolition was probably the most prominent of these reform movements, but it wasn't the only one. Uh, women's rights, uh, this struggle to gain women's rights, uh, becomes one of these major reform movements. What were some of the other reform movements of the mid-1800s? The temperance movement. Oh, come on. You teach these all the time. Come on. Abolition. Well, abolition is one of the most important. Temperance, women's rights, prison reform, schools, public school education, Horace Mann, um, prison, uh, care of the insane. All of these are, are reform movements, and they all fit in the same time period. Even um, utopian communities, right, like Francis Wright, Neshoba community around here, um, or the Oneida community, these all fit into this with the basic idea of all of them that human beings are perfectible. If you just kind of put them in a better environment, then they can be perfected. So it does, you know, whichever one of these you're talking about, you know, even slavery, the abolition of slavery fits into this idea of the perfectibility of man, men and women, making a better society. Okay, so you've got Frederick Douglass as the leading, one of the leading abolitionists of this period. And in 1848, you have the um, calling of the Women's Rights Convention. It's gonna be held in Seneca Falls um, in New York. Frederick Douglass was one of the few men who attended and the only African American. Not because African American um, reformers of this period did not support the movement, but you know, Frederick Douglass had been invited and he said, yeah, I'll come. And he gets to this movement and from that point on, from 1848 on, he is one of the most unwavering supporters of women's rights, of suffrage. Um, the su there's the whole list of things that are, are proclaimed in this women's, from this women's rights convention. And somewhere at the bottom was that statement, the right to vote. And Douglas signs on to it. Douglas is in agreement that women should have the right to vote. Um, and in fact, in one of the speeches that Douglas, he wrote in one of his um, late, his newspaper articles, he says, quote, observing women's agency, devotion, efficiency in pleading the cause of the slave, gratitude for this high service early moved me to give favorable attention to the subject of what is called woman's rights and caused me to be dominated uh, sorry, denominated as a woman's rights man. 
I am glad to say that I have never been ashamed to be th thus designated. Recognizing not sex nor physical strength, but moral intelligence and the ability to discern right from wrong, good from evil, and the power to choose between them as the basis of Republican government, to which all are alike subject and all bound alike to obey. I was not long in reaching the conclusion that there was no foundation in reason or justice for woman's exclusion from the right of choice in the selection of persons who would frame the laws and thus shape the destiny of all the people, irrespective of sex. So this is, he's got this very reasoned argument. This is the way I think, you know, these women have supported us. And some of the early women rights activists um, had, of course, been the anti-slavery ladies of about 10 years before. All right. um, Douglas in 1888, let me just back up just a minute. Now, there was this little time period in which Douglas and the women's rights activists like Stanton and um, Anthony did not agree on the question of basically which should come first in the aftermath of the Civil War. Which should come first? Should there be a push for universal suffrage that would include women? Or was this a time in 1869 when the, the struggle should be about getting the right to vote or ensuring the right to vote for African-American men? And there were different points of view on this. And Douglas took one point of view. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton took another point of view. They had been friends for decades. But on this issue, they were divided. All right. um, they come back together in the 1880s and support women's rights, uh, the right to vote, sorry, support the right to vote. You know that in um, 1869, um, when the 15th Amendment is passed, it is a universal manhood suffrage amendment. So in a sense, Frederick Douglass, his point kind of wins the day. And there's another 50 years that women have to fight for this right to vote. Now, Douglass does not back away and say, oh, great, I won. Uh, you lost. That's it. Douglas comes forward and he says, now that we've gotten this, this suffrage amendment for all men, now we're going to start working for a suffrage amendment for everybody that will include women. Right. Um, there's a very interesting <clears throat> article, and I put the link to this um, in the PowerPoint. I couldn't, for some reason, it's becoming more difficult to you know, download pictures and linked to articles. I don't know what they're doing with the internet. But anyway, I'll have to work that out. I'll have to call some of these people and say, y'all go back to the old thing. You know, Great photos out there, and you won't let us just copy and paste. <laughs> oh, oh, go back one. Keeps yeah. going back and forth. It's, it's probably on a timer, and I'm talking too long. But anyway, this is a great article. Um, it's at blackpast.org, and if you just um, I'm trying to think. I just copy and paste it. I actually had to type this whole thing because it wouldn't let me copy any part of the article, not even the link. So I said, I'm going to beat you at your own game. So I just typed the whole thing. So the link is correct. So if you can copy the link and paste it in the address window, it'll take you to this really good article that deals with Douglas and Douglas's ideas on the women's rights movement. Um, I just read to you the, the link that talked about uh, what that was Douglas and what he said um, in his newspaper. But it would be interesting to just take a look at some of the other positions on secondary literature on Douglas, on the women's rights movement, and the role of African Americans. Okay. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, you get those three amendments, 13, 14, 15, 13, ending slavery, have to always remind students that the Emancipation Proclamation does not do it, um, that you have to have that amendment. 
Um, the 14th is absolutely necessary, I have to remind them, because of the Dred Scott decision. All right. That that has to be, this 14th Amendment on African American rights has to be put in the Constitution because Dred, Dred Scott said African Americans were never intended to be citizens. They are not, they will never will be. So you need that. With the 14th Amendment, you actually did have some African American men in the South who did vote in elections, but not all men. So then you've got the debate over the 15th Amendment. And into that debate over the 15th Amendment, in 1869, you've got the argument of suffrage. During the Civil War, these women who had been very active in the suffrage movement um, and women who had been active in abolition took, put suffrage and women's rights on the back burner. So there was not this strong movement for women's rights during the Civil War. The movement of the Civil War centered, major movement, centered on anti-slavery and abolition. And it could possibly be that they understood more than anybody else that it's really difficult for Americans to think of two major changes in their lives at the same time. They were having a hard time thinking through anti-slavery. Um, they had to kind of work up to that. And if you had thrown in women's rights, even though women were doing things during the Civil War that they had never done before, um, they were creating or being involved in a major national health system, health crisis, uh, going out of their homes into nursing. They were doing all these things, but not women's rights. So when the war is over in 1866, these women step back into the movement to gain their rights. And you have the creation of the American Equal Rights Association. They hold a convention. Uh, Sojourner Truth was the only black woman who was among this group. Um, and Sojourner Truth took the position, if you were to ask her, why are you here if other black people are involved in other things and cannot be involved, why you? And her, her position was that if black women are not enfranchised along with black men, it would leave men as, quote, masters over the women, and it would be just as bad as it was before. She does a little bit like um, Abigail Adams in the Revolutionary War period. Um, remember Adams, all, all men would be masters if they could. So in a sense, I'm sorry, man, didn't mean to. You know, target you, okay. But here are women who are saying, you know, it's just the nature of human beings. If you are in this position and you have this authority then, and this power, you're gonna use it. So we've gotta get women enfranchised along with men, which put her in the opposite, on the opposite side from Frederick Douglass. We just talked about Douglass and he's saying, you know, if we're gonna to have to um, make a choice between everybody or African-American men, we've gotta get the men. We've got to get them enfranchised. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, so in the aftermath of this debate over the 15th Amendment, um, the AERA kind of declines, and two different organizations emerge. One was the American Women's Suffrage Association, the other was the National Women's Suffrage Association. It's a primary difference between them. The AWSA was, I believe, very strongly in universal manhood suffrage that this was more important in terms of getting the right to vote for all men, including black men, than including female suffrage at this point. And they only needed to do it by including one word in that amendment, and that was the word sex. That's all they had to do. But that just, I think, shows how strong 
the forces were, the ideas were, how, in terms of American society, on what should be the proper role of women, uh, that you, people just didn't, didn't feel that this was the time. On the other side, you have the National Women's Suffrage Association, um, which was, okay, everybody. So you notice Stanton and Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Mary Ann Shad Carey had been very active in the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. She's a black woman. Uh, she was also very active in terms of the, what we call, immigration movement. Um, that you've got to go a step further th than just encouraging enslaved people to ins escape and go north, that going north after 1850 wasn't good enough. So she and other people supported the idea that you have to encourage people to keep going to Canada. And to, she pushed something that was called the Canada West Movement. Uh, the Canadian government was very accepting of African escaped African-American slaves or free blacks coming into Canada. They had a lot of land. They had to develop it. If they, you know, having land as a nation is great, but if you don't exploit it and you don't develop it, it's, it's not good. So the idea that you could get African-Americans to go further was something that people like Mary Ann Shad Carey pushed. She was also um, the first African-American woman to start her own newspaper. So she was the, the woman of, of note that, again, very few people actually know about. So she's active in this movement as well. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper is also African-American woman, is a leading figure in the anti-slave, sorry, in the uh, women's suffrage movement from this period, but again, people just don't know Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Uh, she was a writer, um, she was an activist, um, and one of the things that I like to cover with my students, with Frances Ellen Watkins, you can go to the next one, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, um, go one more and then I'll come back to this one. Okay, with Harper, is that number one, she and Douglas disagreed, they didn't, you know, and it's always important to, I think, help students to understand that just because people of a particular race support or have, a common, have common ideas on a movement doesn't mean they like each other, okay? It's not like, take me to your leader and we all show up there, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. You know, it doesn't work that way. Nor if you've got a movement like suffrage, should you ever expect that every person is going to agree on how you get suffrage done? Or the question here, who gets it first? Because people have different ideas about what society is about at this point. So anyway, um, they disagree. This was dissolved. Um, go one more. And one of the most interesting things, <clears throat> remember I said that uh, Harper was a, a writer, a poet. She writes this wonderful poem that I've used um, with my students. It's okay, and it's called Deliverance. And I pulled a couple of the verses out uh, to kind of take a look at. This is nice anti, sorry, nice woman suffrage, but from a different perspective. Have any of you ever used deliverance in your classes? Anybody ever used Frances Harper? Oh, please put her in. She's fantastic. Okay, so she says, if any man should ask me if I would sell my vote, I'd tell him I was not the one to change and turn my coat. All right, so this is the woman. Then she goes back and she kind of introduces a free few men. And she says, but when John Thomas Reber brought his wife some flour and meat and told her he had sold his vote for something good to eat. You ought to see Miss Kitty raise and heard her blaze away. She gave the meat and flour a toss and said they should not stay. Even though the family's starving, she says, no, you don't sell your vote to feed the family. 
You'd laugh to see Lucinda Grange upon her husband's track when he sold his vote for rations, she made him take them back. Okay. Day after day did Millie Green just follow after Joe and told him if he, saw, if he voted wrong to take his rags and go. <laughs> I think that Colonel Johnson said his side had won the day had not we women radicals just got right in the way. And Colonel Johnson, of course, is the white figure in this, um, the white politician, like, I mean, she spells it Colonel, but Colonel in the other one, spelling, um, who is so sure that they're going to win because they've got the, the black male vote. Um, but he didn't count in the fact that these women took a different perspective and that African-American women viewed the vote in a different way. Um, for many white women, the vote was seen as just being the franchise of one person. So when men had the vote, it was their vote. It was not the family vote. It was the man's vote. He could do with it what he wanted. Um, he could not vote if he didn't feel like it. But for African-American women, when African-American men got the vote in 18 sorry, in the 15th Amendment, 1870, they took the position that this was not the man's vote all by himself. It was the family's vote. And very often, African-American women um, from the end of the Civil War had been attending political conventions. Um, for example, uh, let me just kind of back up and come back or whatever. But in the aftermath, well, before the Civil War, African American men across the country had been holding um, conventions, um, not like you know the Democratic convention, but just gathering together and Republican con convention, but just gathering together um, from all across the states where they could, where they did have some political involvement in terms of speaking, even when they could not vote, but just kind of speaking out. Um, they would hold this, they have what they call the convention movement. And in this convention movement before the Civil War, people like Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney stood at the forefront and said, this is what we want for African American people. And we're not just pushing for freedom and the end of slavery. We're recognizing the fact that before the Civil War in the North, African-American people faced discrimination. So we want an end to discrimination, Northern discrimination and racism in addition to an end to slavery. Now obviously that kind of movement is not going to be in the South before the Civil War. But when the Civil War ended, the convention movement came into Southern cities and towns. Um, one of the first of these convention movements was actually held in Nashville um, in the aftermath of the war. Black men gathered to, you know, say their piece, to say, look at what's happening in the state. Um, are the Republicans really doing everything that they can for us? Should we look at alternatives in terms of supporting political parties? All right. Maybe consider Southern Democrats. What can they do for us? All right. So when these conventions were held in places like Nashville, black women didn't just you know, sit at home and wait for the husbands to come back and tell them what happened. Uh, very often you had black women who also went to the conventions, not to vote, but to kind of stand around, to join the parades, to make their presence felt. But this was something that women during this period did not do. This is still the period when you know, many people took the position women should be seen and not heard, especially a proper woman. Um, that it was not your role to take a stand. And the few women, white women, who took these stands um, in the South were some of the most outspoken women that you've ever seen. They were a little unusual. Some of them, many of them were um, middle to upper class white women uh, who are stepping into this period in which women 
are saying we have a right to be heard. Right? But it was unusual for white women. It was not unusual for black women. Political involvement and voting rights were not just the man's responsibility. So if he decided he was going to sell his vote, he better think about just taking his rags and leaving because that was not his to sell. It belonged to the family. Deciding who you would vote for was a family responsibility. Okay. So you already have these two different ways of thinking about politics and voting rights for African American women and for white women. And that's going to be important in terms of how this woman, what woman's suffrage is going to mean and the positions that black women are going to take in relation to women's suffrage. Okay, let me move a little bit through this. Um, sometimes, you know, you prepare so many notes because you just want to make sure you've got enough. And then you realize, I've got too much, but that's okay. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so what happens in this next phase of American history? Because we have to kind of think about what's going on. All right, we go through the Reconstruction period, uh, which in my classes, I don't really deal with Reconstruction. I teach African American history or African American women's history. So I tell them in the af aftermath of the Civil War, you already know what's going to happen. You know about presidential reconstruction and versus congressional reconstruction. I do tell them about you know the violence and the changes. Of course, the Memphis massacre. I have to tell them about that. Um, but I don't teach the political reconstruction. Instead, what I teach is the construction of black freedom because that's important on both sides after the Civil War ends. And answering the question, so what is black freedom going to mean? What does it mean, first of all, to white Southerners, especially the former slaveholding white Southerners? Well, it's going to be a pretty difficult thing to conceive of. Uh, for some white Southerners, obviously, they're happy slavery's over. They don't have to feed, clothe, and shelter all these people. But for others, wow, in a stroke of a pen, we just lost billions of dollars. Or wow, we still have the land, but who's going to plant it? So it's, it's, you have, they have to think about what's going to be the next step and being able to exploit the land. Right. For black Southerners, it means something entirely different. Um, so in the construction of black freedom, students have to think about things like mobility, that before the Civil War, I could only leave this particular space if I had a pass from my white owner. Before the Civil War, I could be separated from this unit that I call family because I have no legal right to this family. I have no marriage contract. All right. After the Civil War, family is, the, is probably one of the most imp important things to African Americans. Um, it could be finding family members that you've been separated from. It could mean legalizing a family, marriage becomes extremely important. Um, so you have people who just kind of flock to Union Army lines to get married. Um, then you have other people who say, well, why would I want to flock to these Army lines uh, to go in here and get a piece of paper to say that I'm wedded to this woman that I've been with for 40 something years? So yet other people said, no, I don't need to get a piece of paper to tell me I'm married. But then going back on the other side, marriage had to mean something to white Southerners and new Southern governments. Because here you have the question of who is responsible for these millions of formerly enslaved people. So let's figure this out. And you have southern governments, I, I'm sure you all have looked at the laws, um, 
Well, the Mississippi black coats are some of the best examples of this. And you can pull them up on, um, if you just go to maybe to the Library of Congress or the National Archives website, and just pull up the Mississippi black coats of 1865. And there's a, one of the codes um, in really the first or second se section on civil rights, granting civil rights, actually says that, and to paraphrase, whoever you are with, if you're a black person, whoever you are with right now after slavery ends, whoever's in your, you know, whoever's your wife, whoever's your husband, or even if you've never been in a legal contracted marriage, surprise, that's your wife or husband in a legal sense. Okay? Doesn't matter whether you picked him or anything. Doesn't matter whether you even love him or love her. No. The government says you are married to that person. Now, why is this so important? Because marriage, legal marriage, transfers the responsibility for women and children. The government is not responsible for what happens to freed men, women, and children. Husbands are responsible for their wives and their children. So you got to figure out how to feed them and clothe them and all of this. That's not what we're here for. We're doing other things. Okay. So anyway, in teaching Reconstruction, and teaching that post-Civil War period. It's good to teach it as the construction of black freedom. What is it going to mean? And control of families, control of labor is essential in how you're doing this. All right. Um, things have a way in, I guess, reform periods. You know, when things seem to be going in a certain direction, like rights and freedom and all of this, and you think that you've gotten to uh, the mountaintop, uh, very quickly, things have a way of reversing. It happens in American history over and over again. Uh, like some people are so terrified of what we see happening in American society, government right now. This is a pattern we had we went to the mountaintop, got up there, looked over, and you know some people are a little afraid of what's on the other side. So now you have sliding down the mountain, coming back, but then there's another mountain and you get to climb up that one. All right. What happens during Reconstruction and in the aftermath of Reconstruction is a little bit like this. That you get to this period where African Americans, men in particular, have political rights, um, where civil rights are recognized under the 14th Amendment. But then soon after that, whether it's through violence, whether it's through intimidation, whether it's through court action, legal action, whatever, things seem to be reversing. So that by the end of the 19th century, you've got two very important Supreme Court decisions that reflect those changes. Sure, you have granted the right to vote to men, but now you discover in 1898 that the Supreme Court has passed something called Williams versus Mississippi, which is a different interpretation of the 15th Amendment. Or Plessy versus Ferguson, which is a different way of interpreting plus, uh, sorry, the 14th Amendment and what these rights are. All right. So get to the mountaintop and then flip over. But you've, and it's going to be a slow crawl back up to the mountaintop um, for the 20th century. Now, in particular, what you start, ha what you see happening, you've got universal manhood suffrage but you see these legal challenges to black voting. You see constitutional changes, state constitutional changes across the South that will put restrictions on black voting. Poll tax, liberty, uh, sorry, literacy tests, um, grandfather clause, that kind of weird, strange grandfather clause. Um, 
What does this say? The grandfather clause. We all know the poll tax, you know, you gotta pay to vote, to register, you know, and do it every time in some cases. We know the literacy tests. <clears throat> gotta be able to read or, and or interpret a portion of a state constitution. Um, if a father or grandfather could vote before 1863, then that person could automatically vote? Move it a little bit closer, a little bit further. Before 1868. Okay. Okay, um, or 1870, okay. depending on different states, because it has to be before you get an amendment to the Constitution that would even allow okay. um, African American men to vote. Um, 1863 is Civil War, so even most um, most white men did not vote, even though they could vote. Okay. So you just say in that year or two before either of those amendments. Um, poll tax, literacy test, grandfather clause, um, residential requirements, um, uh, sometimes uh, criminal court requirements, you know, all of these things just designed to eliminate black voters. And it's pretty definite, you can see how this is happening if you look at the number of black, pe black men who are voting and are listed on the poll tax records in a state before you see these laws coming in in the 1890s and the numbers by the early 1900s. You can see the impact of the laws. Okay. Um, Williams versus Mississippi says in effect that's okay you know, to do this. It's the state that is doing this. Just like Plessy versus Ferguson says that separate but equal, it's okay, you know. If it's separate, you know, that's, that's not a problem, as long as it's equal, all right, which um, many people would say separate is inherently unequal. The court says that by the 1850s. Okay, so this is what's happening. You can move to the next one. Uh, the next few, yeah, this is good. So this is what's happening in the late 1800s. This is setting the stage. And one thing that we have to look at and think about is, okay, how are black women responding to this, to these changes in society? Are they still protesting? Are they still organizing? Are they still working? And the answer is yes, but in ways that we may not even think are protest organizing ways. And that is that black women build on an organizing tradition in their communities. And they begin to organize clubs or to come together in clubs and organizations to help or to benefit the community. To, in some cases, people would say uplift the race. Because that is a principal concern of African American women, especially middle-class African-American women. But when we look at the club women's movement of this period, it's not a movement that's limited to upper-class women. Some of the strongest black women's clubs of the period are in churches. Busy B, that was a club of this period. Um, if you just look at the list of, of organizations in um, club and sorry churches of the period there are many many that are restricted to women there are others that um, include men and women and these are organizations that are working to help the community now do they take a stand on suffrage probably not because that's not a principal issue however every once in a while you have a woman like let's say Julia Hooks in Memphis, who does take a stand on discrimination in voting. And her stand is linked to the position of her friend, Ida B. Wells. Both Wells and Hooks taught in that first generation of African American teachers taught with them in the Memphis City Schools. So they knew each other, okay, knew each other very well. Um, this group also included Another woman, Olivia Davidson, who eventually becomes the second wife of Booker T. Washington. So you've got this prominent group of women 
In any event, there was a lynching in Memphis, um, the third of a series of lynchings of black men in Memphis and Shelby County. 1892 was the lynching at the curve. Um, Moss and Stewart and I just forgot the third man's name. But this is the one that Ida B. Wells responds to and eventually has to leave the city. Okay. Um, 1893, there was another lynching, Lee Walker, very brutal lynching. 1894, there was the lynching murder of six black men in northern Shelby County. Uh, they were being brought back from Brighton, Millington, that Tipton County area, just across the Tipton County line, to Memphis by a Memphis detective. And they were being brought back because there was this suspicion that they had uh, been involved in barn burning, which was a big deal in a, a community like the small Tipton County community. It's not a, necessarily a strong cotton area, but it is a strong wheat area. People keep wheat in the barns. So you burn a barn, you destroy a person's um, crop for a whole year. So in any event, there was, they were charged with this, and they were murdered, brutally murdered, um, as they were being brought back to Memphis. Um, and in the aftermath of this, they, there is a trial of those who are suspected of lynching. Um, Ida B. Wells, who is no longer in Memphis, um, sends her you know, comments on this, and she says basically, this is a time when every African American family needs to have a shotgun in their household, under the bed, whatever. Um, her friend Julia Hooks took a slightly different position. and She said, this is a time when black men need to figure out how to pay their poll taxes and vote, because black men were still voting in Memphis and in some other areas, but definitely in Memphis. But you had to pay the poll tax. Right. So again, and she says this in addition to encouraging black women to join clubs. Right. Eventually, this club women's movement um, moves to a national position. Um, and you have the organization of the National Association of Club Women. Uh, with the first president being Mary Church Terrell of Memphis, who is now living in Washington. She's married and living in Washington. This club women's movement that develops, become, they become strong advocates for suffrage. But that's not their only position. That's not the only thing that they are, are pushing for. They're also pushing for things like kindergartens or pushing for improvements in their community. Suffrage is just one issue. And in many ways, what they are seeing is that all of this for black women is tied to ideas of helping the community or uplifting the race. The National um, Association of, Color, of, sorry, of Club Women <clears throat> takes that as their motto uplift the race. All right. There's, there are white club women's movements at the time, but they don't see their responsibilities as for the race as a whole. So when we talk about women's suffrage, this is something we have to think about in terms of what are black women doing. We have to think about several things. I'm going to try to wind this up real fast. We have to think about several things. One is the situation at the time. This is a period of violence, it's a period of intimidation, it is a period of disfranchisement of black men. But black women are still pushing for the vote. And what's the position of white women who are pushing for the vote? You know, can they come out and tell their husbands, well, we want to include all women, black and white women, in this suffrage movement? Not if you're a southerner. Because southerners have already disfranchised black men. So for you to go home and say, well, we're going to enfranchise black women, it's not going to go. So they take a different position. And that position is, number one, um, it will be very easy to disfranchise black women just like you disfranchise black men. So black women get the vote. And as one author points out, it took several decades to eliminate black men from voting after the 15th Amendment. 
that was done in probably 10 years for black women because the, the framework was already there. Right? But black women still work to get suffrage. Women like Ida B. Wells, like Mary Church Terrell, like Fran Frankie Pierce of Nashville, these are black women suffragists. So you can't, you know, the women who were associating with my daughter and who were telling her that there were no black suffragists, um, obviously wrong. They missed that class maybe, but there were definitely black women suffrage, but black women just had a different reason for pushing for suffrage. They had different goals in mind and different ways of getting it done. So I didn't leave much time. But are there any questions? Feel free. Yeah, you can take time for Q&A. I didn't cover everything, so questions? <clears throat> Well, do you think that it's because there isn't emphasis on black female suffragists during the, because most students don't even think that, they think that the suffragist movement is really just kind of like the 19 teens. And so in those pictures, they only see the white women. Were there black women also involved in the 19 teens suffragist movement? They, yes, definitely. They are there. You just have to see them. And if you just go all the way through to the end, these are some of the early club women. Okay. Um, Mary Church Terrell and Margaret Murray Washington was the other woman. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Early 1900s. Uh, you've got Ida B. Wells in 1913 founding the Chicago Alpha Suffrage Club. In 1919, you have Mary Church Terrell and her daughter Phyllis marching together in suffrage parades and joining suffrage vigils at the White House. This is after um, uh, Woodrow Wilson is elected. So, you know, people are saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, we've just elected a Southern avowed racist to the White House. Uh, maybe we need to do a little protesting here. Okay. Um, Frankie Pierce in Nashville is invited by Catherine Talty Kenny, one of the city's suffrage strategists, one of Nashville's suffrage strategists, on the eve of this suffrage amendment and ratification and all of this, she invites her to speak at a convention on the topic, what will the Negro women do with the vote? And Frankie Pierce says, sure, I'll come and talk. I can tell you exactly what we're going to do with it. You know, we're going to fight to keep it, number one, uh, by also paying our poll taxes. So in many ways, the women are there. It's just a question of looking for them. And you don't see them. But I mean, you don't see Ida B. Wells at that 1913 parade where she just kind of says, I'm not going to be, you're not going to tell me that I cannot march in this parade and I've been fighting for suffrage. So you just wait till my Chicago people get up here. And when they get there, she just jumps out of the crowd and gets in and marches with her group. But, you know, that's not the photo that people took. So, okay, I just want to leave you with one other thing. And this kind of circles back to how are people commemorating women's suffrage? And I will say, first of all, before I begin, I'm a strong advocate of commemorations if they are truly commemorations. Uh, I might even be, I'm a strong advocate for putting up monuments if they reflect the truth and not just, you know, what people want to be accepted as the truth. Um, but I believe that when people put a statue or a monument there, they need to be very careful that they have covered or examined all of the story and that they try to include all of the story. Now, in New York City, um, the city is considering erecting a monument to women's suffrage. Or if they really, if they, because of a lot of flack that they've gotten on this, um, a monument to women's suffrage leaders, which also draws a lot of flack because of the way they constructed it. Um, so there was an article in the New York Times in January of 1919, uh, sorry, 2019, and the title is, 
is a planned monument to women's rights racist? And most people have never even, they're going to put up a monument that's going to be racist? You know, we're just trying to take all these things down. Okay, and I found a picture of it, but once again, photo. It's so hard to, I don't know what they're doing. I used to be able to just, you know, copy and screenshot and all of it. That's how I get around everything. Hey, oh, I've got to try that. I was using the little <laughs> clicker thing. But anyway, I, so screenshot, I'll get that done. Um, it's a nice, you know, it would have been good to show you this. But anyway, this statue has Susan B. Anthony and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton sitting. And it's a monument to women's rights. And they're kind of unfolding. They are the, they are the monument, okay? But they're unfolding a list of others who should also be included. Um, in this commemoration. So on this list of others, you know, their names there. And Sojourner Truth's name is there as an other. Ida B. Wells is there as an other. You don't actually see her. You have to find her name on the list. Uh, Mary Church Terrell is there as an other. And people are saying, well, you know, this perpetuates an idea that says that black women did not really participate, that all of the women, and there are 22 other women listed as others, many of these other women actually were as much involved in suffrage as the two women you've chosen. I think they even have Lucretia Mott as an other, um, Carrie Chapman Catt as an other. She's a different woman, different generation, but not an other. So the big question is, is this going to be a perpetuation of the racist idea about women's, the women's suffrage movement that eliminates the role of women? And in the article, um, they say, in effect, um, in effect, the monument manages to recapitula recapitulate the marginalization of black women that black women experience during the suffrage movement to begin with. You don't see them as a part of the movement. They're just on the marches, margins, on the fringe of the movement. To cite one example, they were forced to, by organizers to congregate in the back of suffrage parades. So this monument, in effect, just kind of continues this tradition. So we have to be very careful. Um, it takes just a year or so to put up a monument. It takes a long time to get it down after you get up. Um, I think all cities know that, and Memphis in particular. It takes a long time to, re uh, to correct the memory. So in determining how we're going to commemorate women's suffrage and what it's going to mean, I think it's up to teachers, all of you, to ask questions or to have your students ask questions about what was that role of African American women in the suffrage movement. This is an important movement. If they fought for suffrage for black men, did they also fight for suffrage for themselves? How did they see suffrage? What did they think suffrage or the vote was about? What did they think voting rights were about? So it's, it's a big question. Questions, I'm just amazed. Now you all, if you were teaching this and your students didn't ask any questions, you'd be trying to figure out how can I pick a question out of John. I know he read the assignment, so I know he knows it. Oh gosh. Do we know they read the assignment, though? No, That's we don't question. really, but, you know. Well, I, I have a question. Okay. Um, you say, said that in Mississippi, the black codes mm -hmm. told you who you were going to be married to and this, that, and the other. So now my question becomes tied to one of the things you said, well, what is black freedom? If you telling me who I have to marry, <laughs> okay. what is black freedom? That becomes one of the criticisms. 
of the black codes. Now, the black codes, in many ways, um, they come in right after the Civil War. Uh, Mississippi, so the South, lost the Civil War. And they've got to deal with this question of the constitutional issues. And black codes are put in in 1865. They are not going to last. And they don't last because of things like the Memphis Massacre in 1866, uh, the riot in New Orleans, um, the violence of the Klan. It becomes pretty apparent to northern governments, the federal government, where people have lost so many lives during the Civil War. The question is, so what, what did we lose, lose these lives for if they're creating a system in 1865 that is the same as the one we just thought we eliminated? So it's in the aftermath of attempts like this with the black codes that you have the federal government seizing, the Congress seizing control of Reconstruction. And you've got um, the Reconstruction Acts. You've got military intervention. You have all these things that are happening. Um, although that little thing on marriage kind of, it stuck. Uh, sometimes people will say of very prominent people in this period, well, you know, such and such a person and his wife divorced and he married again, but I can't find a divorce decree. Um, and I say, well, when did they marry? Well, they were in a slave marriage and they were declared married after the Civil War. Well, if somebody just declares that you're married, then you don't really necessarily have to get a divorce. That declaration of marriage answers the question of what is the legal responsibility of the state for caring for all of these newly free people. And again, some African Americans, they do want that legal marriage. Other African Americans say very clearly, you know, I'm not going to drive all the way to the county seat just to get a piece of paper. So the state tries to solve the problem and say, you don't have to come. You're married. Don't worry about it. You're married. And the other side of this is that you also had um, people who just simply left the people they were with. Um, if you are with Jane when the Civil War ends and the state is trying to declare that Jane is your legal wife, but Jane is not the wife of your choice. You were separated from your original wife of your choice um, and sold apart. There are people who, again, are finding families, searching for families. So you just leave and go find your original wife. Um, some of the best stories of this are actually in uh, the WPA narratives, the slave narratives um, that are captured in the 18, sorry, in the 19, late 1920s and 1930s under the New Deal. And those 2,000 sets of interviews are just wonderful in terms of describing what people saw happening around them. Some of them were children when they saw this, but they saw this happening. So. Yes, and those actually are all available on the Library of Congress yes. website mm -hmm. for free, yeah. public domain. Yes. So. It's a little bit harder to find stuff on suffrage. <laughs> it, oh. Yeah, it depends on the collections. Of, yeah. yeah. Other questions? There's a question, but that was an earlier slide that I would like to see again if I could. Uh, the one where the two organizations were formed. Okay. Um, wait, wait. I, I think I know what you're talking about. Oh, the, right, right here. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you wanted to, <coughs> to get a picture of it. <laughs> and let me just mention that these three women are black women, these two white women. Uh, the same at the bottom, three women are black women. And the top two, um, Lucy Stone and Henry Ward Beecher, is the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. 